Good morning. Welcome to Grace United Methodist Church. Whether you are here in our Celebration Center or whether you're joining us through the live stream this morning or whether you found this, you know, on your Tuesday morning Facebook scroll where you just are trying to read the whole internet and here this is and you decided, what's that? I'm going to watch that for a minute. We're so delighted that you have set aside this time for worship You'll also notice if you're here that uh, we have our worship check-in QR code. You can scan that with your phone. It'll whisk you away to the internet where you can leave your name and any prayer concerns, any contact info that might have changed. If you're engaging this through our live stream, we're going to put a link in the comments and so you can click that link it'll take you to the same place but that is just one way that we do our best to stay connected as a church family well we want to make sure when we are here together that we make sure that everyone is warmly welcomed no one goes by this whole hour and has no one talk to them and so we're going to stand in just a moment as we're able and share our name and the answer to this question you ready what is one thing you really like about your body. I know, this is why we're doing this series the whole season of Lent, because of that, that right there. Your body is good. You got up this morning. It's marvelous. We're going to work on it for these 40 days, okay? So your name and one thing you like about your body. Let's go to our places wherever we're supposed to be. It's my job to herd everybody up this morning. And a good morning. My name is Scott, and I like my skinny legs. And they're very pale, but I do like them, so there you go. This is our call to worship. I will read, and then you will all read the boldface part, or that's how it's supposed to work, I believe. So, beloved children of God, come worship our creator and friend. Here we are, from the soles of our feet to the souls within us. We are here to worship. Come siblings in Christ and attend this gathering with your body, mind, and spirit. Be fully present with us today, from head to toe, inside and out, from our prayers to our thoughts to our dreams, we are present to worship. And if our minds wander, our bodies fidget, or our spirits grow tired, what shall we do? 
Then we shall worship in wandering, fidgeting, or weariness, because we know that God is as close as our breath. Come, all of God's beloved, let us worship. Almighty in your hymnal on page 139. be seated. When we come to worship, it is our great honor and responsibility and joy to pray with and for one another. And so let us go to God in prayer this morning. God of transcendence and incarnation, you sent Jesus to experience life in spirit and life in a human body, to become God in flesh so we could relate to one another in suffering compassion, life, and even death. Therefore, we find you in both our seen and unseen realities. We find you in our regular human activities of sleeping, eating, and drinking, and also in the deeply spiritual experience of living a conscious life on earth. Today we gather so we might worship and encounter you in body and in spirit. Like Jesus, we gather in our faith community to seek wisdom, like Jesus, we listen and ask questions. And like Jesus, we pray we will grow in wisdom, in years, and in divine and human favor. To this end, we pray for our worshiping body, this humble body of Christ. For those who are suffering in our midst, we pray for relief. 
And we ask that you might raise us up to be servants and healers who care for each other. For those who are overworked and exhausted, we pray for rest. And we ask that you might inspire others to help shoulder the burden of joyful labor so that no one feels burned out or used up. For those grieving losses of life or situation, we pray for comfort. And we pray we might be a community of warmth and safe refuge for all who mourn. A community that withholds empty cliches and offers presence and compassion instead. For those who need tangible things, food, clothing, health care, or mental care, we ask that you provide using our resources to alleviate the needs around us. Oh God, open our hearts and wallets to your plans and for the ways we find ourselves at peace, well-rested, joyful, or well-resourced, we pray you would enlarge our generosity to share, serve, give, and make room so that you might be glorified among us. And so we are bold to pray as Jesus taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, we invite our youngest disciples to come on up for their time as we welcome them in song. I got little Mr. Spoiler Alert up here with me uh, because he sees me get ready before I go to church. And so he, he is sure to say, what did you tell me as soon as you got up here? It's an apple. He knows what I have in here. And it's an apple. I know. Bread was a good guess. Bread is delicious and I often do have bread. But bread is amazing. Okay. Well, ta-da. Ethan was right. It's one of his favorite things to be. It is an apple. All right. So here. Here is an apple. Everybody wants to eat it, right? This looks delicious. Isn't that the best part of the apple? Yeah. yeah. No, no, no. Are you going to eat that part? Oh, yeah. No, don't eat that part. In a minute. I don't. I think that's. that's a myth. I think that is a myth. But what do I have? What part do I have here? The seed. The seed. Okay. So it's the part you eat, right? No. Oh, what should I do with it? Plant it. I should plant it. And then wait like fifty years. Wait fifty years. Oh, yeah. And then what happens? A tree. And then after there's a tree, what would the tree give me back? Apples. More apples, yes. Wait, I have a question. So is this, Hopefully. hold on, we got to stay on track. I know, we can talk later though. Is this seed done growing? No, this, is done, this seed's done growing. You think this is done growing, this part? Just a, um, that big hole in it. I know, I had to cut to get to a seed. It was hiding in the middle. Um, I don't know that this is done either because. Oh, yeah, the tree's done. Is the tree done growing? I don't know that. A tree keeps growing, right? Year after year? I know. Oh, yeah. Yeah. This about growing. Okay. okay. <laughs> yes, go ahead, darling. When we're done with this, are we allowed to have an apple slice? Yes, that's why I have apple slices. I know, yes. Like You're gonna, I'm going to offer you apple slices. I didn't eat one, but I think they are because we only buy the good apples. Yeah. So, okay, friends, let me ask you this question. Am I done growing? Never. No. Well, yes. Technically, yes. My physical body, you think, is done growing? Yes. Say no. Yes. But yes. what? A, yes. Hey, hey. The kid don't body. condemn me. That was Ash Wednesday. The kid, the kid body is growing. Your body's growing? The kid body is done growing, but not the grown-up body. The grown-up body. Yeah, things are still changing with all of our bodies. Um, friends, you ever wake up and your body's a little different than it was the day before? No. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Our sick. bodies are still changing. You don't know the change. I, was, I was sick for a little time. You were sick for a little time? Yeah, and I'm, and I'm sick for death now. 
you're six still right now, but you're six in like one more day than you were yesterday. And it, you might have grown like, I don't know, a little fraction of a millimeter yeah. overnight. Who knows? Okay, so I know all of y'all are wondering, the point of this is that, like us, Jesus had a body, and he grew up too. Well, now you do, and knowing's half the battle. No, okay, just my childhood there. So we continue growing, even if it might look like we're done growing, we grow in our spirits, our bodies continue to change, and that's okay. It is a good thing to keep growing no matter how old we are. Growing as people who follow Jesus and try to get more and more of it hitting the mark than we did before. All right? So, growing, yay! Changing, yay! Yay! Thank you. All right. So, we're going to pray, and then, yes, you are welcome to have... That's a big part. You are welcome to have an apple slice. <laughs> Down. He's so excited about Jesus. All right, repeat after me. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for loving us and coming to be with us in a human body. You grew up just like we grow up. And that's a good thing. Help us to keep growing to be more like you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, hold on. I'm going to touch them because my hands are clean. And, you know, you know. Would you like an apple slice? You pass, pass. Thank you. Healthy snacks. Healthy snacks. We love to have our healthy snacks. Simon, would you like one? Okay. Give me the giant one. Shh. Don't be greedy. There you go. All right. Thank you all. You can head back. Who doesn't like snack time during church? I mean, come on. When we come into worship, we remember that all that we are and all that we have is a gift from God. And so let the ushers come forward as we pray for this offering this morning. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, thank you for this life. It's all over the place sometimes. There are ups, there are downs, but it is good to be with you. It, and we know that you bless us so abundantly, so generously. You pour it out like sunshine and rain. And so, God, inspire us to be generous like you, that what we offer today might do more than we could hope or imagine, for it's given in your name. Amen. Morning has broken. Uh, it's one forty five in the hymn.
You may be seated. I invite you to pray with me and for me. God, you know us inside and out better sometimes than we know ourselves. And you know what it is that we need. And so, God, grant that we might hear a word from you, that we might receive what it is that we need today as the scripture is read and as your word is proclaimed. Help us to hear a word from you through or in spite of all that's said or done. In Christ's name, amen. All right, so y'all probably know if you picked up a bulletin already, you probably caught the gist that during this season of Lent, the 40 days crossed by six Sundays, our worship, theme, our worship series is centered on the theme, This is My Body, exploring how Jesus lived in his body on earth. It will also be an invitation to us to take care of and embrace the goodness of our own bodies. It's tricky, isn't it? I mean, y'all heard y'all's response this morning when I said just pick one thing, just one thing. I know you have a list of like a thousand things you don't like, but just pick one thing that you do like about your body. I, most of the consumer culture that we swim in has to convince us regularly that our bodies aren't good enough. They're not thin enough. They're not tall enough. They're not hairy enough. Wait, no, they're too hairy. The companies need us wandering around in constant discontent so that we can buy their products to solve the problem that is our bodies. I don't think that's how God intended it. The poet Jane Kenyon writes about, quote, the long struggle to be at home in the body, the difficult friendship, end quote. Most of us, if we're over the age of, I don't know, five or six, we understand this quotation in our bones. We worry about our body's shape or size. We're frustrated by our body's limitations. We can experience our bodies more as a source of shame and confusion than a garden of delight. It is hard work to be friends with this artisan crafted sack of chemicals and electricity. So it is that I invite us to look to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, when we think about this embodied life. I've always had a more earthy theology. I can't fathom a God who would make all of this amazing stuff. I mean, have you seen this world? The petals of a flower? The spinning galaxies out there that we're able to see now? Can you fathom a God who would make all this wonderful stuff only to hate it? To say that it's only spirit stuff that matters? That we have to hurt or deny our created selves to transcend into some boring, sterile heaven? It just doesn't sound like the God we find in Scripture. No, God made all of this. All of us looked at this stuff and said, it's not just good, it's very good. Yeah, we mess up. We miss the mark. We sin and mar the good creation in the world and in ourselves, but God's love for that creation, for us, is steadfast. The word of God became flesh and blood moved into the neighborhood, and the miracle of the incarnation we celebrate at Christmas, Jesus, our Christ, our Savior, Emmanuel, God with us, is just that. God and creation coming together in a way never before seen. It can be easy for the Christmas Jesus to be our favorite. I know, I've got a real soft spot for baby Jesus and uh, there's a classic film out there, and the protagonist, one uh, Ricky Bobby, makes the case 
in strong terms that the Christmas Jesus is best. So NASCAR is back in season. I don't know who else besides my household is really excited about that. So I couldn't resist sharing this clip from the classic film, Talladega Nights. Let's take a look. Summer's ready, come on y'all. Been slaving over this for hours. Dear Lord, baby Jesus, or as our brothers in the South call you, Jesus, we thank you so much for this bountiful harvest of Domino's, KFC, and the always delicious Taco Bell. I just want to take time to say thank you for my family, my two beautiful, beautiful, handsome, striking sons, Walker and Texas Ranger, or TR as we call them. And of course, my red hot smoking wife, Carly, who's a stone cold fox. Mm. Also want to thank you for my best friend and teammate, Cal Naughton Jr., who's got my back no matter what. Shake and bake. Dear Lord, baby Jesus, we also thank you for my wife's father, Chip. We hope that you can use your baby Jesus powers to heal him and his horrible leg. And it smells terrible and the dogs are always mm. bothering with it. Mm. Dear tiny infant Jesus. Hey, we... um, you know, sweetie, Jesus did grow up. You don't always have to call him baby. It's a bit odd and off-putting to pray to a baby. Well, look, I like the Christmas Jesus best, and I'm saying grace. When you say grace, you can say it to grown-up Jesus or teenage Jesus or bearded Jesus or whoever you want. You know what I want? I want you to do this grace good so that God will let us win tomorrow. <sighs> Dear tiny Jesus, <laughs> golden fleece diapers with your tiny little fat balled-up fist pawing. He was a man. He had a beard. Look, I like the baby version the best. Do you hear me? I win the races and I get the money. Ricky, finish the damn grace. I like to picture Jesus in a tuxedo t-shirt because it says like, I want to be formal, but I'm here to party too. Because I like to party, so I like my Jesus to party. I like to picture Jesus as a ninja fighting off evil samurai. I like to think of Jesus like with giant eagle's wings yeah. and singing lead vocals for Leonard Skinner with like an angel band. Hey Cal. Why don't you just shut up? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Ricky likes the baby Jesus best. And yes, Jesus was born a baby, fully human and fully divine, but he grew up just like we all do. Jesus experienced everything there is for a human life, but there are some gaps in our story. The Bible has a few stories about baby Jesus, and then a ton of stories about grown-up Jesus, and just a few little stories about child or teenage Jesus. Does that mean that he got to skip the awkward part? No, he did not. Nope, our eternal God who had taken on flesh, Jesus got to go through it all. So let us read one of the few childhood stories we have in our scripture from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, beginning in verse 41. This morning, I'll offer it to you in the message paraphrase. So let us listen together for a word from God. Every year, Jesus' parents traveled to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up as they always did for the feast. When it was over and they left for home, the child Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but his parents didn't know it. Thinking he was somewhere in the company of pilgrims, they journeyed for a whole day and then began looking for him among relatives and neighbors. When they didn't find him, they went back to Jerusalem looking for him. The next day, they found him in the temple, seated among the teachers, listening to them and asking questions. The teachers were all quite taken with him, impressed with the sharpness of his answers, but his parents were not impressed. They were upset and hurt. His mother said, young man, why have you done this to us? Your father and I have been half out of our minds looking for you. And he said, why were you looking for me? Didn't you know that I had to be here dealing with the things of my father? But they had no idea what he was talking about. So he went back to Nazareth with them and lived obediently with them. His mother held these things dearly deep within herself. And Jesus matured, growing up in both body and spirit, blessed by both God and people. Y'all, I'm sure you know this, but growing up is awkward. 
Our bodies grow taller and our thoughts and emotions become more complex and we start experiencing them before we all have all the tools to handle them. Along with the physical changes, we also begin to know ourselves better, learning what we enjoy, who we are, how we are uniquely created and gifted by God, even though that may be very different than our parents or even our siblings. In this story, Jesus is exploring who he is, not just as Mary and Joseph's child, but as himself. He's been raised to be a pious Jew, born into a family who faithfully travels every year to Jerusalem to observe the Passover. But this year, instead of traveling back home to Nazareth with his family and a whole caravan of pilgrims, Jesus follows his curiosity, his calling, and stays behind in the temple without telling an adult. I think if he'd asked, they probably would have said no. I'm just guessing. And while he was old enough not to have to hold Mary's hand as they traveled, he was definitely not old enough to spend three days unsupervised in the big city. I mean, he was 12 years old. And while in the ancient world that was right on the cusp of adulthood, he wasn't an adult yet. Along with filling in some of the gaps of Jesus' childhood, the gospel writer shares this story for a reason. When Luke tells the story of Jesus' birth, he made it clear that Jesus is God's son. But here, near the end of his childhood, Jesus claims that relationship for himself. Jesus' purpose and calling are going to extend beyond the way of living and worshiping that he's grown up with. It's another uncomfortable reality for Mary to treasure and ponder in her heart. There are so many parts of this story that we could focus on for today. I had like 15 almost sermons. You're so glad I edit, right? Because I trimmed those right out. We're just going to do one. So for today, I want us to look closer at verses 46 and 47 in this reading. In the NRSV, it reads, After three days... Mary and Joseph found Jesus in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. So this reminded me of a story a colleague of mine shared about um, a new church that he was serving who was coming up to a big anniversary celebration. And the people who had been a part of the congregation for all different years, all different eras, were coming to celebrate this occasion. I believe our church got to do something like this recently as we celebrated our 50th birthday. I love a reason to celebrate. I can't wait. Let's do it again. Well, this pastor friend of mine was talking with folks who had moved away from this hometown. Their work had led them all over the country. Some lived in L.A., and some lived in Portland, and some lived in New York. But they'd grown up in that church together. So they were swapping stories about what church had been like when they were little. They were talking about the life-changing trips that they took, mission trips and camp and the hide-and-seek games where they would hide in all kinds of places in the church and the silly plays that they would perform and everyone would cheer even though, well, you know, it kind of didn't go the way it had been scripted or practiced that day. They were in the sanctuary, and one of them looked down at his feet and said, and I'll never forget about these wooden floors. And everyone laughed except my friend, the pastor, who was new. And the pastor said, what what about the wooden floors? The kids who'd grown up explained that the wooden floors in that church were perfect for sliding When they were younger, they would get on their bellies and scoot all around the sanctuary under the pews, quietly, passing under folks before they'd even known they'd been there. The floors, they said the floors were always waxed right before Christmas and Easter. So they were at their slipperiest on these high holy days, and they would love to scoot around the whole sanctuary. I'm thinking about this as a parent, that the parents were probably thrilled that this is what they did in their holiday best, right? But what my friend said surprised me as I was listening to this story. 
He wasn't caught up in the parent's perspective like we might be in our scripture text, wondering how Mary and Joseph are such bad parents that they don't notice that Jesus is missing for a whole day or maybe commiserating with Mary as she lays into Jesus, giving him a whole dose of mom guilt when she finally finds him. Instead, the pastor friend of mine heard this story of kids sliding around on the wooden floors, making sure there was no dust under there. I'm sure it was all on them. And he thought about all the ways that people know that they are welcome. Welcome can be written on a sign. It can be said as part of the announcements. But the memories that these friends shared communicated that their church home had been a place of acceptance. They knew as kids that they were really welcome there. So I'll tell you, when I walked into this space for the very first time, and I saw that we have a playground right up here, a space that is comfortable and engaging for our youngest disciples, where they can still hear and see what is going on oh, while they keep their hands busy. It's an amazing gift for our whole church family. Y'all, if you ever want to go play on the playground, it's okay. You don't, it's not like an age limit. So if you, like, they've got Play-Doh right now, and I don't know, Play-Doh is fun. I mean, that smell when you open a fresh can, is there anything like it? But having a playground right here as a part of our worship space says clearly without saying a word that children and their families are welcome here. In the same way, our Bible story for today about young Jesus reveals his community's commitments and values. I'm sure when 12-year-old Jesus made it to the temple that day when he snuck off from the caravan, he could have been turned away. He could have approached those teachers with a question or an idea or an interpretation that he'd been wondering about, and they could have easily, politely or not, turned him away, go home. They could have told him, class is over. They could have told him, where are your parents? You need to go be with your parents wherever they are. They could have reminded him that Passover's over and everybody is heading home. Go back wherever it is that you come from. They could have shut him down. They could have shut him out in a million different ways, but instead, he was welcomed even in his awkward in-between era not quite a child and not yet quite an adult what i read here what i hear here is an echo of god's welcome for us at every age and stage yes you can scooch on your belly yes you can pester the teachers yes we will let you play here and yes we will also take you seriously it's you who make this space your own, and you are welcome here, even as we all continue to grow up, because we know that growing up is not like you start a race, and at some point you cross a finish line, and you're done growing. It's more like a long and winding road, and you think you got there, but nope, not yet. You still have more things to learn. The good news for all of us is that God understands the growing pains and is alongside of us every step of the way. For now, in our story, Jesus returns to Nazareth. He disappears back into the fabric of his hometown, and for close to 20 more years, Jesus lives in an out-of-the-way place, far removed from the centers of learning and religion and politics, in the company of ordinary people, Maybe people kind of like us. Here, Jesus continues to grow in wisdom and in years and in divine and human favor. The good news is that this description of Jesus is the description of every child of God, no matter what our age may be. We all grow as we respond to God's love. In Christ, we can expect nothing less Glory be to God. Amen.
please stand as we offer the prayer of confession. Let's all read along together. God of all mercy, we confess that we have sinned against you, opposing your will in our lives. We have denied your goodness in each other, in ourselves, and in the world you have created. We repent of the evil that enslaves us, the evil we have done, and the evil done on our behalf. Forgive, restore, and strengthen us through our Savior Jesus Christ, that we may abide in your love and live into the fullness of your hope for us. Amen. Um, I would say there are lots of opportunities for discipleship that are in your worship guide. I hope you've saved the date for our next work day. It's going to be a lot of fun. You get to play in the dirt and then um, eat good food. So consider those as we leave today. So I invite Stephen Clayton to come on up and share with us um, something that will come for our full consideration next week at a town hall meeting, but that we wanted to share with you today just so that we can um, have opportunity to consider it, because I'm kind of a shoot from the gut kind of person, but I know not everybody is. Some like to have a chance to ruminate and ask questions. So, go ahead. All right, All right. so uh, I stood up here however many years ago it was and talked to you guys about buying this land across the street uh, and kind of led that initiative. And part of the reason we purchased the land across the street was because of the opportunity that it created for this church. We purchased it with a view towards all of the possibilities that it could become, and not any specific possibility. And uh, since then, we've gone through a pandemic, and a whole lot has changed in the church and in our community. But we have in front of us an opportunity that we want to share with you guys, and Barbara Spear is gonna make sure you get a copy of the proposal so that you do have some time to think about it before we discuss it and vote on it next week. But we have the opportunity to list the far north 1.7 acres for sale. It makes up 40% of it is floodplain around the creek. It fronts on Redbud and then a small frontage on the west on 1417 and leaves intact a little over 5.3 acres right here across the street where most of the old parking lot is. The, the reason this came to be is that we've been working with a realtor to sell the parsonage and in conversation with her about other opportunities we may have to really make a big impact on our finances, she mentioned that land like that is selling by the foot right now. And the proposed price that she's encouraging us to list for should the congregation decide next week to move forward with it is $444,000 for 1.7 acres, 40% of which is floodplain. Uh, the council has been discussing the land on the north side of the creek for years now and really have come up with no really strong ideas about what to do. We, there was no appetite to build a bridge over the creek to a lot that wasn't really big enough for even two houses on it, uh, but apparently a developer would love to own that corner piece of property right there. So what we're gonna give you guys before you leave, and we hope you will all take the opportunity to grab it, is a copy of the proposal that was discussed and is brought to you unanimously by church council. But this was a decision we all made as a congregation, and we believe that this next decision is one that we should all make as a congregation as well. So we want you to spend some time looking at the proposal on the back of it, not on my copy, but on your copy, there's a map that will show you what's marked out as the parcel we would be uh, putting up for sale. And if next week uh, we'll have time for question and answer, you can reach out before then if you would like to have a lengthier conversation than the town hall may permit and get your questions answered. And the goal would be in that meeting that if you guys agree that you would vote as a congregation that we could go ahead and list that property. Just so you guys know, unlike the parsonage, which is heavily restricted funds, when you sell a parsonage in United Methodist Church, you can use it to pay down debt or make capital improvements. There's a bit more latitude 
with what we could do with that money. We could use it to seed a project across the street. We could make improvements to our facility. We could use it to seed programming money. So there's a lot of opportunity that comes from some unrestricted funds rolling in. So please make sure on your way out the door that you grab a copy of the proposal, that you look at the map. If you have any questions, you can reach out to any of the members of the church council. All of you stand up. You're recommending this as well. If you're on the church council, stand up. Hopefully you're friends with at least one of these people and you can reach out and ask them any questions you have. And when we come together immediately after church next Sunday, we will discuss this in more depth and then put it to a vote. So thank you guys so much. Stephen. So yeah, one of the things on the back, there's a town hall meeting next week. So you heard one of the agenda items that will be before us. So I encourage you to be here if you can. Um, ask questions beforehand if you'd like. We will ask questions there too. Um, but consider that opportunity. Also, um, United Methodist Higher Education Foundation, I'm a big fan of them. They give scholarships. I'm always all in favor of giving folks money for college. But they sent us um, a Lenten calendar this year that I think I really like because I need manageable bite-sized disciplines in my life. Like, if I make the goal too big, I'm never going to hit it. But like tomorrow's discipline, it says, uh, pray for the children in your neighborhood. I can definitely do that. And so we have some copies of this available if you would like to pick this up to provide some structure for your experience of the season of Lent. They're available in the Information Center as you head out today. If you're at home and you want one mailed to you, just email us. It's info at gracesherman.org. We will get one sent over to you. They can also, we can also provide them electronically, so that's a great resource for us in this season. Well, before we head out in worship, for wor from worship today to serve God and neighbor, let us stand together and sing our closing hymn, Hymn of Promise. It's number 707 in your hymnal, or it'll be... Beloved of God, we are the body of Christ. We are the embodiment called to be at our highest, the embodiment of God's love for the world, since Jesus isn't still walking around and giving folks hugs, hugs and healing. And so, beloved of God, go, keep growing and keep going that the world might know how much God loves them. Go, for you are sent in Christ's name, and the church said, Amen.